thank you very much for the, uh, I know no, I'm really excited to be able just to share you know, a little of what we've been able to learn. And so I really wanted to you know, start this by talking about you know, instructional technologies. And I think that oftentimes we struggle with, you know, what's going to work for us. And so I always start with, you know, how do I teach? And so for me, I was, I guess, mentored to believe that questions are how we learn. It doesn't matter how many times you get the same question. Um, somebody wants an answer to that. So I've always kind of built my courses around this idea of, you know, how screen sharing is paused. No, it's not. We're going to do that again. Let's try that again. Uh, so looking at how, you know, how do you create what I call a community of curiosity? So when we think back to this summer, and we, you know, had these great, you know, workshops, the whole summer is great just to share ideas, we really started talking about, you know, purposeful online teaching and building around these four pillars. And so I wanted to just walk you through some strategies that I incorporated that really gets to the heart of student engagement, active learning, being responsive, and really about being innovative. I'm just going to try to keep this at 15 minutes. Bill and I really like 15 minutes, and then we have a lot of time for questions. So just a few things that I did just to kind of set the frame here, I was really thinking through you know, an onboarding survey. So the onboarding survey is really about finding out where students are at. Um, you know, creating a content baseline, which allows me to really target um, you know, my prompt uh, for their questions around the material, and then integrating instructional technologies is kind of what we're going to walk through today. Um, I know that they're going to share out the, uh, the slide deck here, and I actually have some video examples for you. And this was a really quick and easy um, kind of way to, to kind of display some innovation is that I make these uh, mini lessons or lectures, and I actually created onboarding material for my entire class. So, you know, how to submit an assignment. I walked through a video of how to go through every, you know, actually it's called how to submit any assignment in under five minutes. I'm really walking them through the technical details. Um, this kind of innovation, I was taking a online course and it had these beautiful intro and outros. And uh, my daughter's 15, she loves visual media. I said, could you make this for me? And she said, I can, and she did. And she did it all with, um, you know, royalty free material. And so these are just two examples, you know, I'm not gonna play them for you here, but when you get it, you'll be able to see they're very brief, but I actually, when I record my lectures, I build those together and it just adds a really nice, uh, students say like a professional touch, it's really personalized to the course. And it does not take that much extra of my time. And so I think it's just uh, something I'll kind of talk about as we continue here. So the onboarding survey really gets to the heart of, you know, what are their risks, their needs, reasserts what their course expectations are so they know that as a three credit course, this is the hour requirements, here's what I've, I've done for you. I also took the time, and this is gonna seem a little maybe excessive, but what I did is I took a list of every concept that I'm going to teach them. And it took a while to do, and then I realized, wow, there's so much I'm asking of them to learn. But I then built this survey around it. I asked them, one, how familiar are you with all these concepts? And then I asked them, how much time would you like me to dedicate to these different concepts? And then I assessed it and I used that to really personalize the course to my students. Because if they were all reporting that they were really well aware of something and you know, they didn't really need me to spend much time on it, then I realized going in, I knew where my students were at. And I was trying to meet them where they're currently at. And by developing this baseline, and it was sectioned by units, it made it substantially easier for me to be able to target those mini lessons that I was creating, those mini lectures for my students, as well as when we had our regular course meetings, I was able to really pull from that to say, you know, as a class, you all had mentioned that you didn't know a lot about this. So we're going to start class by and then I would be able to kind of unpack that for them. And it, I found it was incredibly kind of helpful for students because they got at the very first day of the class, they were able to see, okay, this is all of what we're going to cover. And it was a little overwhelming, but then we got to talk about 
how you know how you learn this material, how you start developing the linkages across the information um, that they're being exposed to. I also did a series of welcome videos. Again, I won't play this entire one, um, but the idea behind is it really is it introduces them. This is navigating the course. And then what I was able to do is I actually walked them through the entire course. And I did this for, you know, why and how we're doing our Zoom sessions, why I decided to, to, to use this strategy. I introduced myself, my research program, how to submit an assignment, really introducing them to the course. And these were all embedded in the um, start here folder. So I actually built this navigation and then I onboarded students by sending them an email and directing them saying, okay, you're gonna see the course is gonna, it may seem overwhelming because for some of you, your first time in Blackboard or Canvas. So this is where I want you to go. Go to start here. And then I want you to watch all these videos. And I even turned on you know, the, the tracking data because I wanted to see how often, and they did. Right to my apparently when you tell them they need to do this because it's going to have this impact on them, they did it and they win and they reviewed and they asked questions. And it was really about breaking down some of those barriers. But in terms of the instructional technology, what this is really helpful about is that I got to then explain why I was using these technologies, how they were going to help them meet the course learning outcomes, and really how it creates that. Uh, that community of questions or that curiosity community. So having done that, I really then thought through, okay, I want to identify the curiosity. And I think we've all been in a place where we, we ask, what questions do you all have? And it's silent, right? Like there's just nobody has any. And you're like, certainly someone has to have a question. And they're just all, uh, in Zoom, it's even worse, right? Because you got no faces typically, and you have the chat, there's nothing. It's like, Am I muted? Like at least in a classroom, you get that, oh, I see, I'm gonna pick on this. I know this person has a question. You can't really, it's harder to do. So I built around this idea that I'm gonna prompt everything, right? It's that cognitive prime. I'm gonna prime every type of question I can get. So I built activities around getting questions from them. So I use Packpack, I use Perusal, and I used it's basically book reviews, which really isn't a technology, it's just a book review activity where and it could be any, any assignment that you give them. Um, so we're gonna start kind of breaking down Packback. So I decided to use Packback because I didn't want a standard discussion board. The idea behind this is I needed students to be able to ask questions and I needed them to be able to help others answer questions. And I introduced my entire class in video to Packback. I said, okay, Here's the reason that we are using this. Here's how it is helpful. You know, it's going to be helpful as a class. Um, other than the view numbers. Oh, yes. So, Phil, the, um, I, so what happens is the students start bringing forward questions, and then I actually answer those in these kind of mini lessons lectures that all of a sudden it was their question was being answered. And it was amazing how excited they got because they realized that I was pulling information from all of their questions, right? And then answering them for them. And with Packback, it was also really helpful to say, uh, uh, Caitlin, I gave them extra credit. So they also loved that. I gave them 1%. You do it, you get 1%. And on Packback, I said, okay, I need, I cannot answer everything for you. Right. What I got to do is I have to teach you how to answer questions, right? How to bring the evidence to answer that question. And Packback allows me to do that. And so I tell them, you have to ask one and you have to attempt to answer two questions from your peers. And so when I, this is actually a little bit older. Um, this is when, before this got scheduled. So I checked today and I had 1,700 questions asked and I had uh, 30, almost 3,400 questions responded to. And what I appreciate about this is it really streamlines my ability to identify, you know, what are high quality or high curiosity posts and everything, the whole course is built around that community of curiosity. And what Packback does in terms of their ability to help visualize curiosity, this is kind of looking at just the first couple of weeks, 
is the curiosity is increasing. They, they are adding more depth, right? So it's not they're asking surface level questions. They are doing the work to try to answer, to ask good questions. I'm able to go in there and identify really high quality questions, bring them into this like weekly digest. Um, I was able to find out that the average curiosity is somewhere in the, the mid fifties, my class in the, almost 80. I was so excited about that. And you know, this is really helpful for me because I can gauge over the week what's happening, how much engagement. Um, and then again, they get a prompting. So I'm priming them around, okay, here's everything that we covered this week. You can ask questions on anything. Ask one, respond to two. And then incorporate a perusal. And I think a lot of this was around, we give students things to read, and then we really never know if they, you, you can figure out ways, but I think we all intuitively know sometimes they just don't read. And they're not pulling out what they need. So with perusal, I can put them in small groups. And it's kind of like, you know, like it's crowd sourcing annotation, right? It's like you're, you're reading as a group, annotating as a group. And I put them in groups of 10. So I usually teach 200 to 400 students, depending on if it's fall or spring. And this has been really helpful because I can quickly identify what they're pulling out in terms of the information, you know, where the questions are that there's actually this feed where it's kind of um, unanswered questions. And I can tap right into that. It also is really helpful for me to identify how much time students are spending. What I found is I was underestimating how much time I thought it would take to read something. Because when they have to read it and they have to annotate it, it takes a lot more time. And so I had them, for example, read uh, Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham jail. And they were so engaged in that, drawing parallels. I mean, it was really powerful. And these data really helped me quickly identify what I needed to be talking about, where I needed to contribute. So they really got a kind of a clear picture of all of this. Um, and so kind of bringing all these together, every activity I have is really about them asking and answering questions. And so by doing that, I was able to identify where they had, you know, they didn't understand how to use Google Scholar. So I made a video on how to use Google Scholar. I had students go, I have no idea how to cite. Never, I don't know how to do it. So what did I do? Create a video. Here's how you can very efficiently, effectively cite in Microsoft Word. And I walked them through, here's how you do it in a video. I had students look, I don't understand these four pillars, right? These cornerstones. So I made a video on those cornerstones. It was everything about personalizing the, the student experience that I could pull from that content baseline and go, okay, as a class, you knew a lot about this, but you also wanted me to spend a lot more time on it. And so my, my guess is, this is why you want me to do that, because it's contemporary, we're talking about these topics. Is that true? And they go, yeah, I loved it. And so I was able to do that. Now, with all that said, and I realize I have about a minute left, I will tell you this, did it take more time? Absolutely, <laughs> I'm not gonna, no, this took more time, because it, it means, Doing this is about personalizing it to the class, right? Which means my standard lectures, my, my standard, I can imagine, yeah, I, I recorded and saved all of these different mini lessons. So I may or may not be able to use them in the future. I'm gonna hope that I can use them, but I do know having done this prior that every course is a little different. They wanna dive a little deeper on something, they have questions, and that's really what this is about it made it exciting for me because I wasn't going through the standard kind of road approach, right? It was actually, I would get entirely question, new questions that I'd never thought about before. Um, and that was exciting because that means they truly want to learn something a little bit deeper level. And then I could just take the time to unpack it for them. Um, and then bringing all of that technology, you know, it was easier to onboard students because they took the time to explain why I was doing this, the way I was doing it. Um, and then every week was really being able to go in and pull a student question and go, hey, so-and-so had this question, making certain that they were here <laughs> for the session and go, all right, talk, share a little bit why you wanted to talk more about this. And they would introduce it and then I would unpack it. Uh, and I think, again, really helpful way to just create that synergy of 
at least for me, that community of curiosity, which is what all this is really about. And then, of course, there's you know all my contact information. If you got a Q code, there's the Q code for all of it. And uh, looking forward to your great questions. David, do you want me to go ahead and read some of these questions that are in the chat or did you already address all those? I did not. I just saw that Phil and Bethany, I, I, we could do them now or I was thinking Bill would uh, go through and then we just circle back and then just have a, a nice kind of discussion. I'm, I'm happy either way. I can address them now or towards the end. All right, I'll just keep track of them. We'll address them all after Bill's presentation. Sorry, I'm trying to hit my unmute button. So I'll go ahead and do a screen share. Um, and I, I really wanna thank David for sharing what he has done and, and sort of setting up that, that spirit of curiosity and engagement with students. And that's, I've tried to do this as well, but I've done it from a certainly different approach. Um, so let me go on ahead and share my screen with you and start my presentation and also my timer to make sure that I, uh, I, I, I stay true to myself and, and my promise to try to keep this to 15 minutes if I can. Um, so I teach in the sciences, I teach biology 107 here in Pullman, which is um, a class that started the semester with 450 students in it. So large enrollment, um, introductory freshman quote unquote, although that's not quite true class. And so I took a slightly different approach to, um, to large classroom uh, instruction um, in a remote setting. So I'm gonna talk about management and finesse. Um, the first thing I wanna say about my journey, and I'll give you an overview of what I'm gonna talk about and then I'll actually get into it, is I, you know, I think where I started the semester was with this idea of patience, grace, and compassion. And although I'm not going to talk much more about this, I just want everybody to know that that's what really underlies everything that I've done in my class. And, you know, you want some practical tips. Here's practical tip number one of how to have patience, grace, and compassion. And that is turn your, turn your um, email system to offline when you go to respond to student questions. Um, and unlike David, I didn't make a lot of videos, although I did make some at the beginning of the semester. So I did use some of that approach as well. But you know, after you've heard the same question about 10 times in a day, especially with the volume of email traffic that remote teaching brings with it, sometimes hitting this pause button and then composing a message, leaving it for about five minutes and then coming back to it can really make a difference. And, and so that's, that's one of the tricks of the trade that I've really um, paid attention to this semester. And, and it's, um, I think, helped immensely with my ability to really show that compassion that I want for my students. So that's number one. Um, the other things that I'm really gonna dig into today is similar to David, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I've tried to build community in my class. Um, another thing that I've really embraced this semester, I think is I've started to really embrace and leverage the flipped classroom model where students learn before they come to class. And so this semester I've, I've made, um, Panopto videos for all of my lectures. And I, I used a lot of the, the tricks that we heard about this summer in the large classroom groups to really break them up into more bite-sized chunks so that students aren't sitting there for 50 minutes with a video. Instead, they watch you know, a couple of 10 to 15 minute videos each day and then expecting them to have that when they come into the Zoom classroom. Um, and, th and that's something that I, now that I've got those materials together, I will probably continue that when we go back face to face um, and really leverage that time together in a face to face manner to really drive student learning. The other thing that I did this semester, I think that saved me is I, I'm using undergraduate learning assistance and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that program and, and how I've structured it and what we've been doing this semester. Um, and if anybody's interested in talking about this more offline, please let me know. Um, I've already started some conversations with other people in, in STEM disciplines about this idea. And then finally, 
Um, getting back to a, a theme that um, David really got to was, you know, keeping students engaged with the course material on a regular basis. So let me go ahead and dive in with this. Um, the way that I start every meeting just is another one of those practical tips is I start out with this slide where we talk about Zoom etiquette and I remind them. Um, I, I try to remember that we're all busy creatures and we have a lot of things going on in our lives and we're not going to remember rules very easily especially when our frontal cortex link is um, a little bit impacted by the stress that we all feel, both pressure of our jobs, our families, and the changing um, you know, environments that we find ourselves in. The other thing that I found that's really helpful is to remind students that really you know, in Zoom that the chat is about class-related things. Um, and, and it's really important because in a classroom where you've got a Zoom call with you know, 200 to 400 people, it's really easy to lose track of important questions, important ideas that come up from the class. And I wanna preserve that for my students to give them a place to have a voice. And the other thing that I tell my students is don't do private chats. And part of the reason why is because I see really interesting things sometimes in the chat whenever I pull up the Zoom recording afterwards that I don't think they really want me to see or other people <laughs> for that matter. But also if a student private chats me during a meeting with 200 to 300 students, it's probably gonna get lost in a chat. I'm gonna miss it. Um, so I'll tell you more about how we monitor chat during large classrooms um, with my learning assistants here in just a little bit. So the, again, this is how I start every day. And in fact, I, I will continue to do it until the last day of the semester, just to give that structure to students and, and remind them of sort of some boundary conditions we'd like to have. So let me first talk about community and how I've tried to build it in my classroom. Um, one of the things that I learned in several different trainings this summer was, was really, I'll talk about one thing that I found that works and that is using one word check-ins at the beginning of Zoom using the chat box. And what I like about that is it just sort of grounds us and brings us into the space together. And I tell students, you know, make it PG rated, assume that your parents might see it at some point. Um, but um, I am curious about what's going on for them. And then I can go back and I can acknowledge that later. And the way that I do that is I usually follow up with my students with a word cloud. So I take what they've said about what's going on and their answer to this prompt. Sometimes it's about feelings, sometimes it's about you know, what are they looking forward to over the weekend? We had a really fun chat about what people are going to do for Halloween a couple of weeks ago. And then I'll produce these and I'll go on ahead and bring them back the next day. And, and again, this is a way to validate and just acknowledge what's happening for the students in real time. This is from probably about three weeks ago and it, it's probably not a surprise to you um, what our students are reporting right now that's going on for them and, and how they're feeling. Um, the other nice thing is I get to learn some of the memes and, and other phrases that they're using that I don't understand um, as a, now what's an older professor. Um, and so now I, can, I have a little bit more uh, street cred and vernacular is what I would say uh, to use. So what didn't work? One of the things that I really wanted to do was I wanted to try to build community on the first day of class by having them get into breakout rooms and really learn about who the other students were in the class. And, and the goal here was to start to get them to interconnect with each other. Um, and this didn't work because of the breakout room feature in Zoom. And, and I learned the hard way that these are hard limits for the number of people or the number of breakout rooms that you can have. The one in particular to really pay attention to is that you know up to 200 participants, if you get a large Zoom room like what I've got, you can have up to 50 breakout rooms. If you exceed that, what I'll tell you is bad things will happen. And so on day two of the class, I tried to set up more than the number of breakout rooms that are our upper limits. And for some reason in the back end of the software, it said that I as the host had left the meeting even though I was still in the Zoom call. And because of that error flag, all of the students from that point time point forward got locked out of the meeting for that day. And so I had about a third of the attendance that I normally would. And it was simply because I set up the wrong number of breakout rooms or tried to preset the wrong number of breakout rooms. So make sure you hold fast to these limits. Um, you know, I, I found that breakout rooms, even up to 
20 different students work well for some of the pedagogical things that I'm trying to do to get them to engage with questions to sort of reason things together um, and, and, and so forth. And I can tell you uh, later about how I use breakout rooms in that way. So the second thing that I found that has really allowed me, I think, to be more effective is really leveraging that flipped classroom model. And so there's several things that I've been trying to do in my class for quite a number of years. Uh, and it's been more difficult using a more traditional classroom model. So one of the things that I've been really interested in doing is, is in STEM is really getting into issues of, of inclusivity and diversity. And, and I think that starts with the recognition that I'm part of a, you know, the predominant group that we see in STEM, unfortunately, still to this day. Whereas, you know, if I take my class, this is not what most of my students look like anymore. They're not white males. Um, instead, they come from different ethnicities, different cultural groups. Um, you know, most of my class is female now and things like that. And so by getting the flipped model in place, it's allowed me to sort of dive and delve into some areas within the classroom itself where we can really start to talk about diversity and, and get into sort of the, the historical content of, of, of science a little bit more. So I'll just give you one example. Um, this was from when we were talking about uh, uh, viruses and pathogens during a lecture, oh, about probably four or five weeks ago. And I got to introduce Johanna Wisterdick. Um, and I didn't know anything about her. And I found her on a, um, a website that was for people of uh, color from minorities and women in science who really their stories don't get told very frequently. And so what was really cool about her is I didn't know this, I learned a lot from it. She's actually the, the discoverer of Dutch elm disease. So if you've ever heard of that, she was the scientist who actually discovered it. She was the first female professor in the Netherlands. Um, during her time there, she supervised PhD candidates, almost all of whom were women. And I love this quote that, um, you know, she really wanted women to be able to feel like they could just do it as well, if not better than men. And I thought that was empowering um, and, and a message that my students really needed to hear and they needed to hear it from somebody other than me. And so um, I've really embraced this um, and, and that extra time that I get in Zoom now because I've done the panopto and sort of offloaded some of the content allows me to be more creative in my classroom space with bringing in inclusivity and diversity into the sciences. So that, that's a really a, a positive reason for it and something that I really wanna grow and build on in the future. Other areas of diversity and inclusivity that I've been able to get into as well um, is really acknowledging you know, what people bring to the classroom. And so this is a, a, a presentation that I gave in the class probably about two weeks ago when we were talking about microscopy and cell biology. And, and one of the things that biologists do all the time is they use a lot of colored pictures. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the time they use a lot of red and greens and, and color blindness is a, real, um, is a real issue for many students who do wanna become scientists. And so for my color abled and, and my color disabled students, I learned about the, the Koblis color blindness simulator this summer during our, our large group um, work here. Um, and so I decided to go ahead and try this on some of these images that I would typically show to students in my classroom. And so I wanted to take you through some of these just to show you the impact that color blindness will have on my teaching. And, 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 to, and I acknowledge this with my students. And it was really cool because what it did was it blew up the chat with people you know, talking about you know, this is an issue that I've had, or this is an issue that my brother has, or my sister, or a relative. And so it really kind of built an inclusivity in the, in the in, in an acknowledgement of the issues that people face. And so this is for people that have blue weak um, uh, color blindness, if they were to look at this image here. Um, what's important here is that these green objects here are, are specific bi biological structures. The blue is also a specific biological structure. And then the red dots symbolize something that's important as well for students understanding. You can see that with blue weak and green weak, you're starting to wash out some of those colors if you're colored able. Here's red blind, okay? And now you can't even see those red dots anymore. And so if I had a student in my class who was trying to look at this and decipher the information that they were supposed to take from it, they would really struggle with it. And then here's blue blind, um, this, this color, um, uh, color blindness type. 
And so showing the students this again was really powerful. And so what I was able to do then was to talk to them about some of the choices that I make in teaching and why I choose some of the figures that I do. So here's an example from um, what I used in Panopto. This is conveying basically the same message or information as what I had before. But whenever I ran it through the color blindness scheme, I was able to find that for almost every one of these students, they would be able to pull out the pertinent information that I needed them to get. And so again, having this ability to work in a large space and have the opportunity to sort of upend what I've been traditionally doing has been really beneficial for me and my students. Um, and this is just one more example of that. The other thing that I have been able to do because of the flipped classroom is really to talk about current events. And of course the current event that everybody wants to talk about and my students wanna know about is COVID-19. And so this is, um, was part of a lecture that I gave, oh, probably about week three in the semester. And normally we wouldn't talk about viruses until very late in the semester. And what we were able to do is to really talk about in, in the current terms, in the context, much like what David was talking about, about finding out what students are curious about and things like that. I was able to connect the material that they were learning in real time to aspects of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and how it interacts with human cells. And so I've done a series of lectures on this over the course of the semester to really talk about fundamental properties. And so, for instance, we might start out with this, um, this micrograph. And what this is, is this is lung tissue um, and it shows these little black dots or the virus particles. And you can see where they're at inside of these um, epithelial cells from the lung. And then that allows us then to dig more into the biology of the virus and talk about not only how does it get into cells, but then how does it get back out in order to go and infect others? And it's been, that, I think that aspect's been really positive for my students and, it, and it's helped, I, I know, drive some of their learning um, from what I've seen on assessments and things like that. Probably the biggest thing that I've done that's had the highest impact this semester, I think, is, is using undergraduate learning assistance. And, I, and the impact is not just on my students, but it's also on me and my ability to be successful in a large classroom environment that's remote. These are my three undergraduate learning assistants, um, Shane, Maddie, and, and Trinity. Um, I owe much more to them than I can ever express. Um, they have been with me the entire semester, the three of them have, and I'll tell you more about how I've utilized them. All three of these students um, are life science majors at WSU, and they all took the class within the last three to four semesters as well. So what do I ask my learning assistants to do and how do I use them in a remote environment? Basically what I have them do is I have them set up on a rotation system where two of them join me each day inside of the live Zoom classroom. And we, they attend the class with me and then we do a 15 minute debrief right after class ends and the students have departed. Um, what they do during the class is that they are really there to monitor the chat so that I can focus on delivering content and things like that. So they, on, behind the scenes, they answer straightforward questions. And I actually go through the chat every once in a while and I'll review the questions I get asked and what their responses are just to make sure that there's um, to verify that what they're saying is correct and that way I can correct anything that might come up. I've not found any major instances where what they've said is incorrect um, so far this semester, which is really good. And also what they do is they monitor for recurring questions that keep popping up. And then I could pause what I'm doing during the Zoom meeting and I can ask them you know, directly, hey, is there anything coming up in the chat that, that we need to take care of? And then they'll tell me, They'll say, yeah, a couple of students asked about this aspect of this problem. Could you go back and review that real quick? And that allows me then to monitor student learning, monitor student curiosity and, and what's popping up in the class in real time and, and really address their needs. Super user tip number one on learning assistance is we set up a back channel communication system using text messaging so that we didn't have to use the Zoom chat in order to communicate this is a lifesaver because if there's something going on they need to alert me to, it stays out of Zoom and comes up directly on my phone, which I've got sitting next to me. So it's a little bit of multi-channel, but I think it works well. Um, we've had some really interesting things happen in Zoom as many of you may have as well during live class periods. 
And it's allowed me to get on top of those issues and, and really address them um, in real time, especially with problematic behavior that we've seen. The other thing that the learning assistants do is they offer one hour of student um, office hours each week. We call them student learning hours. Um, so now, instead of me being on Zoom all day for the class, I've allowed other people to get experience with being tutors and, and to help students. Um, the attendance in, in office hours online has been fairly spotty, to be fairly honest with you. Um, my learning assistants might get one or two people per hour who come in on average, which I, I wish we had more, but it is what it is. Um, so, but that's the other advantage of learning assistance. The other thing that we do is each week for one hour, we meet and we talk about pedagogy and what's going on in the classroom and how I'm leveraging it and sort of the, the underlying ideas behind why I do what I do. We do an instructional review, go through each class period and talk about you know, problematic areas so that I can improve or they can improve. And then we also do a preview of the coming week so that we're all on the same page with what material and information is gonna be covered um, during that week. Super user tip number two is this has revitalized the way that I do review sessions. So I purposely put in additional days before each exam to have review sessions. And my learning assistants actually came up with the idea about how to run these. And I, I love this idea, so I wanted to share it with you. So first of all, what we do is we set up using the Blackboard Q&A board in the class space, we go on ahead and set up a place where students can just post questions or concepts that they're struggling with still. And we do this the week before the exam. So this would be like Monday to Wednesday, we'll leave this open. Typically get about 10 to 12 students who respond to this with ideas. We go through them, we collate them into the three biggest concepts that, that the majority of the students seem to be having issues with. And then the learning assistants go, and they develop with feedback, 10 minute presentations with introductory slides, clicker type questions using Blackboard polling or annotate functions in Blackboard. They go on ahead and put these presentations together. And then what we do is what I call a do, -si -do And I'm in the main Blackboard space running the show. We send the students into three breakout groups. So all three learning assistants are there on review days. And I send the learning assistants one into one of the three rooms, each one. So for instance, learning assistant one might start out with the first hundred students, this, this cayenne group, there's a red group here and there's a purple group here. After 15 minutes, I just move the learning assistants and keep the students in place. And so I don't have to make and remake breakout rooms. All I have to do is as you know, the super user, I just go in and physically move the learning assistants amongst the three groups. And so this way the students see all three presentations during that Zoom review session and only the learning assistants are moving at the same time. So this has been really, I think, effective and, and, and well received by the students um, so far this semester. The final thing I wanted to talk about real quick, and I'll, I'll be done in just a moment, is, is keeping students engaged. I've also used Packback like David did. Um, again, here I'm using it in the scientific context. My responses have been really good. Um, I was just checking Packback and I've got almost 4,000 student questions that have been asked over the course of the semester. I don't quite tie them in as well as David does in real time, but at the end of the semester, I've certainly been recording questions and I'm gonna be using those for my class revision for the spring and then going forward with ideas about topics that students might want to see covered more. The other thing that I really like about Packback is by seeing these types of questions, I have a class that's an introductory class that has 50, students from 50 different majors across campus that come and take it. And so this really gives me sort of that diverse picture of what my students are interested in and how they're, how they're transactionally inter interacting with the material that we're talking about in my class. Um, I've been actually really impressed because the students have been using what I consider to be really high quality sources for the information that they share and for the, the, the questions that they ask. So they've been going to you know, the National Institutes of Health and Nature and the Centers for Disease Control um, and also some other sites as well. So I think that's been positive. 
And then finally, I've been trying to keep them engaged with the material because we know in remote learning, one of the hardest things to do is for students to stay engaged with the material on a regular basis. And so I modified daily quizzes that I used to use in class. They're low stakes, five point quizzes. I build them out of a pool so that they see a random set of questions each time. Um, and then they occur after each lecture and I give them about a 48 hour window to do these. My participation on the quizzes has actually been really good even in a remote environment. So I've been getting participation rates of about 80% of the students are doing each quiz. So that's, I, I think that's really positive and a way to keep them on track. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop. Um, here's a little bit more of my contact information. Email is the best way to get a hold of me these days, just because you could play where in the world is Bill, um, although I'm not wearing a red and white hat at this point. So I wanna thank you all for coming. Um, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day for yet another Zoom call and, and, and I'll take any questions and I know David will as well. So thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Bill and David. Before we open up the floor for questions from the group, let me go ahead and run through the questions that are in the chat. Uh, so the first uh, question here is, David, did you have a good response rate to your survey? Meaning, did a majority of the students complete the survey? And did you provide incentive for them to get it done? Yeah, so we mentioned that really high response rate. So they had, you know, when it's the first day of class, they want to get engaged, and I gave them 1% extra credit. All you had to do was complete it. So very high response rate for that. The uh, I think that in terms of the fee, looking at Bill's question, um, I know Bill and I, we had this conversation, you struggle with it because it's $25. Um, and the way that I, you know, I, I did my very best. I didn't want to have them pay for anything. But, you know, in this class, we used it 15 times. Um, and what's really nice about uh, Pack Pack is since it's a running activity, um, I've seen a large percentage of my class go back to earlier weeks and answer those questions, which for me was like, oh, that, like, that made this real, right? Like a discussion board, it, this would not work in a, in a discussion board type of environment, like the traditional Blackboard or Canvas. Uh, so that's the way I kind of justified it. Is, um, but I also you know, explain to the students why. It's really got to be about the why um, we're using this technology. And then they got it. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I tried to really talk about the selection process that I used and how I came to the determination that Packback was the right technology to use. But also I had the advantage that I was able to leverage the fact that I would be using some other alternative technology if we were face-to-face. -face. So for instance, I would be using a clicker technology or they would have lab fees and things like that associated with the class. And so I was able to sort of tell them, you know, I'm, I'm using this as an alternative tool in lieu of other things, technologies that we would have to use if we were face-to-face -face in the pedagogy. And I think that I'm not sure that placated everybody, but it, it seemed to resonate with many. And I'm going to kind of do a remix on one of the questions that are in the later chat. Did you have any students complain after you gave them this reasoning or did you give this reasoning once students complained? How did that work out? Preempt, you know, it's a be open and honest. And like Bill, I had a q and I actually have a course Q&A and a student asked that question and the student responded like, you know, that makes sense to me. Right, like I understand that this is just a low fee, um, but I have students that really they couldn't they couldn't afford it for a few weeks, and then I just had to be flexible. I think Bill's very first thing, you know, compassion, really being flexible with them. I said, no worries. Here's what I will do. Here's how we'll handle that. And they were like, all right, it makes it okay. I can't afford it, but I can. Once I can, you'll be able to help me earn my points. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, excellent. Um, another question that I'm going to look at, uh, David, other than view numbers, what evidence do you have that the intro video folder were effective? I think we, we talked about that, but it really was seeing students put it into practice. And so that was, uh, you know, that's what the way I looked at it was that they really did, you know, act on what I was offering. And so I would see that in activities um, I would see them reference it. So they would reference in their questions what I had talked about in the video. Um, so really everything has, it's about closing the loop. And so much of this is if they ask, 
help them be able to solve that, have other students be able to help. I think the TA, what a great way to just create that community. Because uh, again, all this is about, can you get them engaged? Uh, can you keep them engaged and focused on the learning outcomes? And here's a question for the both of you. How do you organize your schedule keeping up with these various inputs? Do you make and post all videos on one day? Uh, do you post videos several times a week? Announcements, what does that look like? Go for it, Bill. I'll jump in, you go ahead. <laughs> um, at first, I think I was doing fairly well because I preloaded quite a few of the things that I wanted to do. As time has gone on, it's become more of a just-in-time teaching model um, with these things. What I found that I had to do, especially with things like Packback, is I really, I just put on my calendar an hour every Friday, because I know most of my students wait until Friday or Saturday or even sometimes Sunday when it's due to do Packback. So I'll wait until late in the week, but I schedule an hour out of my calendar where that's all I do is pack back. I go in, I read questions, I, you know, pin things. I do some other things behind the scenes. My learning assistants were on a tight schedule with, you know, we meet every Thursday night at six o'clock because that's when we all had time. Um, just really trying to be purposeful and methodical about how I structure um, that kind of stuff has, has, has been the lifesaver for me. I agree. That's, you know, has been my approach, just standardizing it, really having a very specific time on my calendar. When I built my course schedule, I had my time. I really thought about you know, when was, did I want to schedule out for, you know, my research time? Um, I think I overschedule everything. If you were in the large group, you saw we shared out this Excel spreadsheet I developed that automates a lot of what you do. You can put your dates in and it'll populate everything for you. And a lot of people excited, like, this is a game changer for me. Because um, my goal was I need to streamline what I do. Um, the, what takes the most time, honestly, is when they have really, really neat questions, right? And I mean, like, I had a question on, you know, the excessive fine clause of, you know, the Eighth Amendment. And it was like, this is, well, one, I can't just say, well, you're going to have a criminal law course or a constitutional law course. So wait for that. They wanted to know. So I had to take the time, but that made it really fun, right? It was that, and I guess that's the part is when it's fun, you make the time, right? Does it eat into my research time? I say yes, I know it does. Um, but I also realized that it's really, at the end of the day, it's for the students, right? Like, I love my research. My research program has absolutely slowed down. I know that it has objectively so. Uh, but at the same time, I realized that the student experience during all of this, I'd much rather put my emphasis right now on giving them a good experience and let them know that they can be effective learners in this environment. Um, you know, if, if you tell me that this is going to be my next four years, <laughs> I'm a very different person then. But for right now, it's, I look at it, it's a temporary need. And so I'll use these technologies to create those communities. Um, so. That's kind of where I looked at it. All right, here's another question for the both of you. It says, oops, and my screen just shifted as they're putting in comments. You guys are both awesome. Um, wondering how you are thinking about the spring term without a spring break, especially in a virtual large class. What are you thinking about for keeping engagement without exhaustion? Exhaustion, yes. I want to acknowledge Gretchen this is something I've been thinking about although it's been sort of on the back burner just a little bit because trying to get through the fall semester day by day but um, I think this is something that we really need to be thoughtful and mindful of about our students is that they are not going to have that week break that they normally would have um, one day off here and there I'm not sure is going to replicate that experience and so I may need to think about how to leverage class time to give them maybe two days off, right? From activities or something like that. But I, I don't have an answer yet. I don't know if David's thought about it and has a brilliant idea for us, but. So I modified my spreadsheet because I knew I was gonna go back to it. And I gave him, <laughs> right? I just built, I built an entire activity. It's called a reflection activity. 
um, where they know what they have a big project they have to do. And so mm -hmm. it's about, I gave them class time. I'll be available. Yeah. But let's get, if you have it, you come in, we'll work through it. But I built in specific time for them. Cause you're right. If they don't have it, um, it's there, something is going to suffer. And mm -hmm. so by building in, and we've been working out with that some of our grad students is being mindful that it's okay to build in that yeah. flex time for students and for yourself, yeah. right? As long as you can connect it back to the course learning outcomes and how it's going to help them, you know, achieve them, mm -hmm. um, then that's okay, right? But yeah, I think this is, but yeah, all I did is I just added in a whole section and then built an activity around it. And of course it's color coded. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, they can, and then I share it with the students, so they know I was purposeful. <laughs> I, I don't know if uh, Valor is going to read it, but I did put in the chat that you're a complete machine, David. <laughs> and I love that spreadsheet. I couldn't, but I just wasn't strong enough. I couldn't do it. But uh, I don't know, Dave or Bill, if you're going to be. Uh, do you teach 107 in the spring too? I do. Yeah. yeah. So, you know the labs. You know, when you take one day out and it's a different day, Monday, some days, Tuesday, and other days, it doesn't really matter because if you have labs that meet on multiple days, then. So, so, so I'm just sort of thinking about that part too. I mean, maybe it's some go to lab, some weeks, some don't, but then how do you. I only talked about the large lecture. You know, what I didn't talk about that I've done this semester too is that we're doing a, a, a we're doing a, a cure, a, a, an undergraduate research experience in the labs for 107 as well, which we've had to put together in a virtual format on the fly as we've gone along. So we're gonna keep that in the spring. And the nice thing is because the students are already working asynchronously, having different sections off kilter isn't going to affect us as much in an undergraduate research experience as it would if we were doing traditional labs where things are very structured and, and are supposed to occur in, in a linear sequence. The other thing that we're really gonna do is we're gonna take our teaching assistants and make sure that they teach sections that are on the same day so that all their sections are somewhat synchronized with what week of the semester they're in as opposed to the other sections as well. But yeah, that's going to be a challenge. I'm going to need to steal David's color-coded spreadsheets to do this, to keep everybody on track um, with the labs. It, it is going to be a huge challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the transparency at the front. I, I mean, I really can't stress that enough. I mean, you can show your students everything they're going to do it, right? Do explain why they're going to do it. And they see it on the first day and they can just have this snapshot of every due day, everything. It just makes it so easy for them. They're like, okay, I can plan around it. Um, Kimber, I saw your quick for me. I'm going to keep both backpack and perusal. I, I love them, right? I, I really do. I mean, maybe there's diff there's better companies or technologies that are better, but anything that allows me to grab questions in real time around what they're curious about and then to get them engaging with each other, I love. I mean, I... It, yeah, I can absolutely see me doing this in a like a lecture hall going and actually bringing it up, right? Like bring up Packback and go, hey, <laughs> look, look at the leaderboard, right? Like what, this is a great question. And then just like bringing students into the conversation. My worry though is when they're not there, right? Like that's what we are. At least here I can look through the list of students and go, oh, you're here. Okay, now I'll introduce your question. So I worry if, you know, you do that eight times and no one's there, you're like, throw your hands up and it's like, whatever. <laughs> yeah, Kimber, I was going to say, you know, I think the two things that I'm going to keep is I'm going to keep the flipped classroom. So even if I go back face to face, I'm going to keep my Panopto recordings and expect students to have those so that they can come in the classroom and really engage in different activities. It's, my God, what a, I feel like I've been more creative in the last six months than I have in a lot of time in my career, to be honest. Um, it's challenging and stressful, but it's still a positive, right? Um, the second thing that I'm going to keep is I'm absolutely going to keep my learning assistants. My God, what a godsend to have near peers in the classroom, helping students, addressing questions. You know, actually, fun, well, one of the things that I've enjoyed about my learning assistants is they'll go in the chat 
and they'll read what students are posting and they'll know how to interpret it and they'll be able to tell me what the question really is. Whereas, you know, I'm not up to date on all the memes and the running gags and all this other stuff that they're engaged with. And so <laughs> from that standpoint alone, <laughs> it's been really fun to have them as well as being, I think, effective and productive for the students themselves who are in the class to have that resource set. So very, very key things. Thank you both. Yeah, that's helpful. So Mary Kay asked, how much do I pay them? Um, I had a little bit of funds because we're not using as many teaching assistants this semester um, with the move to remote instruction, but I'll probably go on ahead and make it um, a class that they enroll in. So I'll put up a section of like 499 credits or some other um, type of credits that students can enroll in. And then that way they get academic credit for it in the future. And I, I know that that works well at other institutions, um, just acknowledging student time and effort. Um, if I can pay them a little bit, I'll try to in the future, but you know that's not guaranteed given financial limitations that we're facing now, so. And I think my students get much more than just a paycheck out of it. I think their intellectual benefits, what they've told me are, are pretty high. Um, you know, they feel like they understand the material even better. It's helping them with their more advanced coursework. Um, I, there's some real positive benefits to learning assistance well beyond what I expected and anticipated. Any other questions or thoughts for our speakers today? All right. I'm going to go ahead and put in the chat if you need assistance with ideas or or bouncing ideas or generating ideas for uh, the different challenges that you have with large classroom. Um, Bill put his email there in the chat. Uh, David, if you could go ahead and drop your email there in the chat if you want to. I'm also going to put in the chat the link for the AOI Open Lab. And so that is also in the chat. And I'm just gonna put a little plug. We are thinking about starting a sort of community of conversation regarding large classroom. If you're interested in taking part in this, it'll meet once a month. Dave and Bill have graciously uh, volunteered to help make that happen. If you're interested in that community of conversation, definitely um, let me know. Uh, I'll send a follow-up email to everyone really brief to to kind of gauge the interest on that, just meeting once a month over the next couple of months to just talk large classroom uh, ideas and um, and get some get some feedback from each other. I really love the energy here today, and we thank you. We thank everyone for coming. Thank you so much. I agree with Kimber. Thank you, Val. Thanks oh, for <laughs> this is great. Yeah. Glad we could get it rescheduled and get a good turnout. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming back. We just fumbled a little bit that last time, but we just thank you for coming back. And uh, we look forward to just being of assistance to everyone here over, over the course of the end of this semester and going into next semester. Just reach out and let us know. And I'll definitely, I see some in the chat saying they are interested in that, interested in that conversation. And so I'll go ahead and set that up and we'll get that going. The one thing I'd, I'd real brief, I would really like to see if we, as we do this and we start growing this community, we think through, you know, how we build some evaluations around what we're doing. Because as we all know, kind of that, that lack of evidence around really empirically, mm -hmm. is this working? You feel it's working and that might be great, but, you know, I think that a lot of times what we want is what's the efficacy of those interventions or the strategies. And I would really appreciate it at WSU, we could start generating some data and some consistency around, you know, does PACPAC empirically work within these different contexts? I really would encourage us to really kind of move towards that. I agree. I agree. David, we'll definitely, you and Bill, I'm going to wrangle you guys in for that next meeting and we'll, <laughs> we'll build out the skeleton for, for that next endeavor. I think that'll be great. And for those who are interested in watching this uh, recording of this faculty-led workshop, we have to make sure it's accessible, you know, make sure it's captioned correctly. The captions are correct. That takes about two weeks. So just give us two weeks and we'll put this up on our website um, later for those who weren't able to make it, they'll be able to view this very helpful presentation. 
Thank you. This was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone have a wonderful day and uh, we wish you well in the rest of the semester. Thank you. All right. I do have one question if you guys have a minute still. <laughs> um, I wasn't able to say it quickly enough earlier. Um, I'm wondering how you balance compassion with also not being a project manager for everyone in the class, right? Having extended deadlines for a bunch of different students. Uh, in the past, what I've done is I've built in flexibility to, into my classes. So I have four exams and three of them count for the grade, right? Mm -hmm. And no matter why you have to miss one, you know, you can always take the optional final. Uh, and similarly for quizzes and things like that. But there's just so much that everyone is dealing with right now. Um, and I want to be responsive to students uh, but I also don't want to have to manage 70 people's schedules, right? Um, and deadlines are there for a reason and, and some other things like that. So I'm just curious if you guys have any thoughts about how you have um, been both compassionate to students in this uh, really unprecedented times and also um, maintained some of, you know, some boundaries and uh, in your own personal life and, and as an instructor. Yeah, well, that's so multi-layered. Um, I think, first of all, compassion for my students comes from my own self-compassion. And so I've done my best this semester to block out Saturdays off my schedule. Just family time, personal time, downtime, work in the yard, yeah. go walks, you know, or... Veterans Day, I blocked out the morning and I just said, I'm not going to touch email until noon. And I barely made it, but I got there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, that's number one. Number two with my students, um, I'm kind but firm on a lot of things. Okay. You know, I think that begins with acknowledging the situation. I found my students are surprisingly transparent about things that are happening in their life. And, and I, I'll be honest, I have very few situations I can think of where I really question the veracity of what I was hearing. There's a few. Okay. But even then, I think I can respond with some kindness too um, and acknowledge what's happening. But also, you know, sometimes those conversations are not for that day right? Sometimes they are for, you've got a crisis, you get through this, and then you, you know, it's on you to follow up with me, right? So I want to hear from you a week from now. And we'll talk about what happens next, right? And, and I found for most students that works well, right? And it keeps my sanity, right? It's, it's not a big ask of me to do that. Um, you know, and, and I'm not making side deals with students and stuff like that, right? You know, if a quiz is due, it's due, but I've built in some flexibility and, you know, you can miss up to four. I probably will boost that up to missing eight this semester for the final grade. It'll change things a little bit. And I'll get some student complaints, but I'm, you know, I, I, I feel like I need to do that. I need to increase the number of assessments that, I, that I'm going to waive just because people are... I, and I saw Gretchen's comment in there, and that was, you know, she found that even communicating better doesn't help the semester. And I, and I actually, I agree with her. I found that too. I, I don't know what David does. Maybe it's his colored spreadsheets or something, but my students still can't keep up with deadlines and stuff. And I don't know if that's a function of an electronic environment. I don't know, you know, I, I, I've got a calendar up on my wall still that's the old whiteboard one, right? Where I can change things and, and kind of keep track of stuff, but they don't do that. And for many of them, I think that would really help. And so a lot of it comes to the personal connections that I've made with students too. I mean, you know, I'll jump on Zoom with them for five minutes and say, you know, we need to get on here and talk about this. Don't email me. Mm -hmm. This ain't working, right? You're stressed. You're going to write things that you're going to regret. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just come talk to me. You know, I'll make it as comfortable as I can, but we need to have a conversation. Um, yeah. And I think, 
that's actually, I think, alleviated a lot of problems that I think I could have had this semester is just that acknowledgement that, you know, yeah, this is a facsimile of reality and, and connectedness, but we can at least still try. Yeah, right? for my smaller class, it has worked well. I actually required students to meet with me in the first two weeks on Zoom, just like a really quick meeting, mm -hmm. just to kind of try to get some of that initial rapport you get in the classroom. But, you know, once you get to 70, over 100 people, then it, that's just not realistic. Um, yeah, I do a lot of generally saying nice no's, like, I'm really sorry about your situation. You know, like, I understand this is, this is hard. Mm -hmm. And also here's what's laid out in the syllabus and I wanna be fair to everyone else. Like that, that's kind of generally my thing, but there's just the volume of things that are coming up this semester is just so much more. Um, so maybe that's just the managing the volume is different. I agree, it's, it is, and, and it's, it's not only severity, or, or I'm sorry, it's not only volume, but it's severity. I think there are things happening now that in the past we would have never heard about or found out about or even been remotely connected to. But I think that need for connection is so strong for many people. At least I'm finding that as a faculty member, I'm sort of that point of contact for some of them. Like I'm that person mm -hmm. they're reaching out to. And so one of the things that I did about a month ago or a month and a half ago was I put together a resource list for all of my TAs, my graduate TAs in my lab. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you know, how, who do you call at the community action center? Where can students go to get counseling? Where can they go to the food bank at? Who can they call if X, Y, or Z happens? And that's actually been very useful in a couple of instances where the student was in the lab, they were having a crisis and the TA was actually able to engage them with resources mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in the moment. Um, that's a great idea. Oh, yeah. And if, if, are you in Pullman, Bethany? Vancouver. You're in Vancouver, okay. I don't think I have a resource list in Vancouver. I would send it to you. I've certainly got the one for Pullman, but um, there may be something yeah. like that already available that you could just beg, borrow, and steal <laughs> from like yeah. the, the student's office or someplace like that. Um, yeah, that, that, that there is. That sounds good. Well, thank you. I just kind of wanted to brainstorm with how other people are handling it's, <laughs> this situation. It's, you know, it's the biggest challenge of the semester. You know, it really is. It's, yeah, I feel emotionally exhausted. Not just physically, yeah. but emotionally exhausted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing I do, Bethany, so I try to handle that, oh, I missed the quiz or I didn't know. Mm -hmm. and, and then trying to be fair to the students who are on top of things and getting stuff done. I've offered uh, some stuff, but at, for half the time or if it wasn't a timed exam, then it, it's timed now, you know, for those who, mm. for whatever reason, they skipped it. And mm -hmm. so I've done that. And I, and I, like Bill said, you know, just being very forthright, kind, but forthright and saying, okay, I understand we're all going through things and I will let you take the quiz, but you will only have half the time or, you know, mm -hmm. and so that way I don't have to rewrite a new quiz for them, right? Cause that takes time that goes through my mind yeah just maybe just putting some more restrictions on that extra opportunity you know it, it shows that you care and you don't want them to fail at the same time they have to get on top of keeping track you know that to-do list every week is very helpful put a to-do list so they look at the to-do list each week and they know what they're doing that week what they have to hand in that week yeah that's a great idea i like that the deluge i'm concerned about is that we're at the drop deadline almost. And I'm starting to see that trickle of emails. You know, what can I do to make up this? And those are going to be potentially challenging conversations to have. Well, usually at this point, it's like, there's not a lot you can do to completely make up. I, yeah, you know, I agree. Been behind the whole time. I think it's gonna be the volume that's the challenge. Yeah. It's going to yeah. be the volume. 
normally it would be sort of a, a drip drip trickle but yeah mm -hmm. actually my my email like man, student management time has gone way way up mm -hmm. oh yeah, yeah so so I think those questions that we would get in face-to-face, face -face, you know how they run up to you after class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're now getting all of those questions via email, you know? Yeah. Actually, something that's helped me with that is having myself and my learning assistant stay on for about 10 minutes after each Zoom session. Mm -hmm. Students will actually hang out and then we'll be able to talk a little bit. So it's almost like being in the classroom and being at that podium or whatever's in the front of the room. Yeah. And giving them that little bit of extra time. I found that helped to alleviate some things. So instead of just cutting off the Zoom call right on the moment, keeping it open a little bit longer. And then my learning assistants actually, actually sometimes will chime in with some things as well and insights and stuff. And so it takes more time takes more scheduling and stuff to make sure that I've got that rubber time at the end of class. But that's helped, I think, for me at least with some of that, you know, what would have been the after class, just mm -hmm. chat questions, concerns type of stuff. So something yeah. else to think about. All really good ideas. Well, yeah, thank sure. you so much. You're welcome. Hi, Bethany. Yeah.